The first car in this series celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Miata is the NA, the first generation car. I'm standing in front of the one of the first three ever made, red, white, and blue, which were shown at the Chicago Auto Show for the first time. Now there is a ton of history on these cars. We talk to some of the people involved with this. We look at the underbody, the engineering behind it, and we get it out for a drive to kind of show you what it's like after all of this time. My name is James Kilborn. I'm currently accessory analyst. Back in the 80s, I was fortunate enough to work on the first generation MX-5 program. Well, it's amazing that we're here today right now in the uh, original, per se, uh, studio. Um, there's a mezzanine up here where Mark Jordan and uh, Chin were working back in the day, and also this is one of the first areas where we actually started doing uh, initial clay modeling in the company. This is really the uh, original room of where the MX-5 was, was really created and, and the initial clay modeling was performed. So when I joined uh, Mazda in 1982, um, I started you know, working with Bob Hall and he had this idea of having this lightweight sports. and uh, subsequently, uh, we hired Mark Jordan, a designer, and um, we also had a Japanese designer, um, Mark Yagi, that we uh, was dispatched here from Japan. Um, Bob was kind of relentless about trying to get this vehicle produced, so um, due to his persistent nature, um, Yagi-san and Mark started sketching um, renderings for the car um, and then probably about a year later uh, Tom Matano joined on board. Bob and I um, actually the other day I reflect upon it I met him like 1972 at an auto expo in LA in a convention center and then, and then I went to the show and in the back of the show this guy the blonde headed guy reading Japanese magazines and I missed that particular, that was my favorite magazine, but being in the States for a couple of years, I, I was missing that magazine, so I went up to him, can I take a look at that magazine? And he kind of replied in Japanese, said, okay, go ahead. So we started become a friend, and he said, I got more magazine at home, or vice versa. So we start becoming a good friend. So that was like 72. <laughs> so, you know, way before all this thing happened, Following that, there was actually a competition between the Japanese Hiroshima studio and the Yokohama studio in Japan. And there was actually um, three different concepts. One was front engine, front drive. Um, that was the um, proposal from um, Hiroshima. And then in uh, Yokohama, they had a midship car similar to an MR2 and then our car was a front engine rear drive um, vehicle so there was a competition i can't remember the year exactly but there was a hiroshima um, kind of competition per se and everybody gravitated towards the front engine rear drive car that we had had assembled or produced and um, at, at that point in time we were pretty you know certain that we were going to get the the thumbs up to continue developing the models and, and get an, an additional second and third clay done, uh, which then eventually turned into to where we ended up with the first generation car. Okay, for one day, 
like Mr. Good and I decided the car didn't really have the personality that we wanted. So he went on in the front and started shaping clay. And I went on the rear, start shaping the clay, you know, like we're not, like we're not looking at each other, just starting from the rear and he's starting from front. And then somehow come to the near the middle when we stood up, you know, get off the, 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 the stand out and back and, and both got exactly the same flavor. I mean, that's how close that we, Mr. Quinn and I became on what we needed to have. You know, I mean, that's not a sketch or anything. We just felt it. The car should have a certain personality. See, again, if one of the ingredients are missing, it wouldn't have happened. The inspiration behind the MX-5 really was due to Bob Hall's passion for two-seat British sports cars. The RX-7 also was kind of internally a very core vehicle for that inspiration. The success of the first generation RX-7 was, was kind of paramount internally at the company. Also, you know, how well the vehicle was doing in IMSA racing at the time. So that gave us a lot of inspiration. There was a, a Triumph Spitfire that was sent to Japan years ago in the late 70s. And I know that Kenichi Yamamoto actually drove that car and got you know, inspiration about what we were talking about. And then later on, probably in the about the mid 80s, we sent um, a Lotus Salon S2 to Japan to send over there to the guys. It's like, if you guys can recreate this performance and kind of this fun to drive aspects of this little this little S2 Lotus Salon, then you know we're going to have a home run. And, that, and we pretty much did. I mean, I think uh, the uh, the performance on the Miata maybe suffered a little bit compared to that, but. Overall, I mean, we were really surprised when the car finally got, you know, pilot production cars over here back in the, the late 80s. It was just like, oh my God, this thing's a home run. They did a great job. And, you know, and, I'm, and part of that makes me think like, yeah, because we sent that Elan over there, I think that's what Horizon probably really, really studied that car really well. And Colin Chapman, you know, we probably got to thank Colin Chapman for, for, <laughs> for, some, <laughs> for, some for some of that, yeah. Um, I don't know whether we explained to you, Mr. Hirai was a chief engineer. <laughs> when he was assigned, he came to me and says, look, I never knew anything about a sports car. I never drove one. You know, I haven't done anything. But they assigned to me. So I'm going to put my life into this project. So tell me what exactly you want to do. The great part of it, looking back, is he has no preconceived notion on his own. So whatever we told him to do, he replicated as best as he can, you know, in his way. So we talk about gear shift, you know, the wrist motion. He try and try and trying to find that best possible way. That's why he's, we couldn't believe that he delivered that shift of, you know, feeling of a shift. We, we, we pitched it, but we never thought that's going to happen to that level, for example, right? And I said, exhaust note is very important. Well, he says, send us a sound. I said, no, you have to feel it on your heart. The American feels vibration, not just sound through the ear. You needed that, but he never showed up. But evidently, he recorded all different sounds and clinic it define two or four, three final sounds that people think is a little red sports car. And he dissected that wavelength in every mid-range, you know, and find a common thread on those three sound. He recreated that combination of that to make a Miata tailpipe sound. Again, he has no conceived notion, so he had to find a way in a scientific, his engineer way, to reproduce it. So that, again, it's a fortunate. If we had another guy, did a prior RX-7 or something, became a chief engineer, couldn't have happened. I think the first reason the car worked so well was because of the affordability. That was a key, a key aspect of, of the car. The, the styling of the car was another thing um, that I think, you know, the, the front, long front nose and the short deck lid gave you that traditional kind of British sports car styling, and I think that's one of the really strong appeal points. 
And then also, I think um, just the overall vehicle dynamics, due to the lightweight, the dynamics of the car was exceptional. And again, you'll, you'll, you'll discover that when you, when you get behind the wheel of the car. I'm setting off in one of the first three Miatas ever made. And this has 8,900 miles on the clock, which technically this is brand new. It is extremely weird to drive this. In some ways, in other ways, it just makes sense. I think the thing for me is you realize how comfortable this is. And the only thing that's particularly different about it is it's on Dereza 2s which is you know, a pretty aggressive compound for a car like this of, its, of, it, of the era. So you hear some tire noise from that and it might increase the stiffness slightly, but this car rides so soft, so comfortably, I can see why it was so popular to drive every day. The main thing to me that is a complete standout are two things, the transmission. There is an insane mechanical feel here. In fact, when you first start this up, you notice right away how notchy first, second, third gear are until you get heat in the transmission before those gears engage smoothly. Once you get the, the transmission up to temperature, this has to be one of the best feeling transmission, manual transmissions I've been in in a long time. It just, it makes you feel so connected to the car. You're actually doing something when you're throwing a gear in place. The steering, on the other hand, is the total opposite. I mean, it's a manual steering rack, but it is so slow and sloppy. It's got that 90s car, like, imprecision to it. Uh, when you turn, there's just so much body motion. The front, the front part of the car and the back end of the car don't particularly respond that quick, but that's also why this, this car feels so good over all these different pavement types. <laughs> There's this whimsical feeling to it. It's so open, it feels so light and small that you can get it anywhere and do anything with it. Now, in terms of drivability when you're on the highway, one of the things that I thought was hilarious is at about 70 miles an hour in fifth gear, because it's only a five-speed manual, you're revving at about 4,000 RPMs. And you know, if that, this was a today's era car, the best part would be, oh, you know, you'd have nine gears, you'd be at 1,000 RPMs. Whereas you're sitting here at 4,000 RPMs, you feel like there's something wrong with it. And it, this is just how, how things and the gearing was back in the day. Now, in terms of acceleration, you know, you, you gotta kind of go back. It's just a four cylinder that you have to wind out. There's no peakiness to it. There's no variable valve timing where you feel like this pickup of acceleration when you hit the higher end. It's just, you sit there and wait for it to rev out. And it's not, you know, it's definitely slow compared to modern standards. You know, this is, that's one of the things you're gonna notice right away, but that's also part of the charm of the older four cylinders. You had to work them more to get the rewards. But as this stands, I feel like the big thing for me is I appreciate this because of the simplicity and the design of it and just how damn comfortable it is to drive around. It's, it's like something that's disappeared. It really, it just, the only thing that really recreates this is the ND Miata. And even that feels a little bit more intimidating. It feels more fitted, tighter than this does. And I feel like I could literally drive this all day long and never feel a bit of fatigue, assuming that the weather was good. The NA Miata, you drew it up, you knew the people involved with coming up with it. So how, from an engineering perspective, did the architecture get 
designed in, in, a, in a way where the company could afford to make this dedicated product? Well, um, basically the, the initial beginnings were based off the X508, uh, actually 77 GLC um, was the beginning, and then um, Mazda's technical research department, they, they took a RX-7 uh, rear axle and cobbled that together and that was kind of the, the very, very early, early on, you know, non-running prototype vehicle. Con they decided that they were going to use the 1.6 liter engine, the B6, um, but they knew that they needed to improve the powertrain. So they incorporated a uh, aluminum oil pan. Uh, they reconfigured the cylinder head to include larger intake valves. Um, and also, you know, we, those types of uh, improvements would, would improve the high speed breathability of the engine. Change the co engine code of the, of, the, of the powertrain from B6 to B6ZE. And so that's actually the, the, the final uh, engine code for the MX-5. Um, as for the transmission, um, the, the first tranny was actually based off RX-7, but because the rotary engine has more wider power band and torque, um, they actually had to change the internal gear ratios. So they made a much more close ratio transmission uh, gears in the MX-5. And um, they also changed the shifter because it was more of a longer throw kind of for the RX-7. Um, and they actually shortened it up quite a bit for the MX-5 and it's actually well known for its real clicky, notchy uh, shift linkage, which was um, actually a, one of the, the joys of driving the car. Putting in perspective, designing a sports car today versus back 30 years ago, I spoke with multiple people, different engineers and designers, how they say it's so difficult now to produce a sports car because you have regulations, crash structure, electronics, all the things that go into it that compromise the overall design. So I wanted to know from your perspective, when the NA was being designed, did you have a lot of the difficulties? Was it easier then to do this type of project? Uh, even computerization was way less then, so it was more of a manual process. So was it easier then versus now? Yeah, I, I believe it was easier then uh, compared to now. It's, it, it's more of a challenge these days with uh, more stricter emission uh, regulations and safety regulations. So I, I believe that it was the right time, I guess, to develop the, uh, the NA. And, and, and we were fortunate, I guess, in the sense that it probably was easier back then. And it's probably more challenging today to, to develop, for example, the ND uh, than it was back then to develop the NA. Well, the, the hardest part of the car, you know, because we have product design, shoe design, the lead time is what, three months? And four seasonal design that you have to create, for example. Cars are like four or five years into the future and you have to predict it and another five years to, to the next one. So the longevity of really looking into the future is more critical than any other industries. So again, to me, the Miata project is all sort of happening in a right moment, the right place with all the connection of people gathered together in that one time. All of us get together, used to look through the magazines and the thing is, all the cars we want is either way expensive that we can afford, or they're those that we could afford, but they are way too old. You know, like a Fiat a fifth, uh, 124 or Alfa Romeo. All these cars are not being developed further than 10, 15 years prior. So we need to have a modern technology, latest uh, reliable sports car that we can afford. They are nothing on the market.